right, got a gun right there. Let me get a gun right here now. Give me one set. Right, bear with me, my people. You find me not. All right. All right. All right. If you guys want to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. Oh, my wife is in here. Hello, boy. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> my wife hasn't sat in an actual service. Uh-oh. It's been a really long time. <laughs> a couple years. A couple years. It's been, it's been a while. Now I'm nervous because... <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. All right, let me get to my spot here, and then we will. I'm sweating. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for being God, and we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you for this time to be able to gather together, Lord, and to praise and worship your holy name. We pray, Father, that as we get into your word and as we worship you through word, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move, that you would shake and rattle this place. We pray for a revival in our own lives, Lord. Not that we're dead, but Lord, that you would bring, this, bring us to the fullness of, not, of life that you desire us to have, Father. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be the teacher this evening and that you would touch our hearts in unique and specific ways, Father, and you would answer prayers that we've been asking. And Lord, that you would reveal yourself in the mightiest of ways, Lord. We want you more than anything, God. More than everything else, I pray that you would be honored and that you would be glorified in this service. Get me out of your way, Lord. Have your way this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you do me a favor? Will you grab me that coffee cup right there? I forgot to turn on the TVs too. I'm messing up this morning. Woo, this evening. I think it's morning. That's good. You can leave them on. They'll turn off on their own. Ah, oh, you can turn them off. Go for it. It's right there. Just boom. Hit it. And it's just powering off on that top corner. All right, Genesis chapter 28. If we remember back to last week, we left off with Rebecca going to her son, talking him into being deceptive, talking him into going to his dad to deceive him to steal the blessing, which we found very odd because it was the very blessing that God had already promised Jacob. But nonetheless, the mom had this knack in her to think that she's got to just weasel her way in and help God out. And we saw that similarity between Rebecca and Sarah. Because when we looked at the life of Sarah, they did a very similar thing. They wanted to help God out. And last week we saw that as she helped God out, she did it in a conniving, deceptive, foolish way. And for her doings, her son gets sent off. Today we're going to see the actual sending of him off. And we talked about this at the end of service last Wednesday. This is going to be the last time that Rachel ever sees her son Jacob. And Jacob is her, that's her baby boy. That's her, her favorite son. Hey, there's two boys. Isaac loves the manly man and Rebecca loves the weenie boy. But that's what it is. And he's mama's boy and she loves him. And oh, I just love my baby. Isaac, meh. I'd rather have Esau. He's a tough dude. He's, he's a man's man. That's, that's the boy that I'm proud to call mine. And we saw that she wasn't having none of that. that her son that she loved, they're both her children, but the one whom she favored would get the blessing. And we saw that she didn't have to do that because God in the previous chapter already promised her that Jacob would rule over Esau. But she does it. And that brings us to today, or that brings us to the end of last week. I'm going to pick up on this because it picks up with this. She goes to Isaac and she wants to send him away. Do you guys remember why she wants to send him away? Because Esau wants to kill him. Because he's a man's man. He just messed me up. Boy, I got, I got you. When dad dies, I'm going to stick this javelin through your heart. Now, he didn't... Make a lamp out of him. He didn't say quite those words with the javelin or the lamp, but you get the idea. And he's a man's man, and when a man's man says he's going to do something, you can expect a man's man to follow through. So if you call yourself a man, and you don't keep your word, then you're probably not really much of a man at all. Somebody's saying, I'm going to jump him after this. What? <laughs> I'm a man's man too, I got you. But on the real, though, a man keeps his word. 
And I'd imagine that Esau was probably known for doing what he said he's going to do. Today in the hood, we say, I'm real. I'm real. I do what I say I'm going to do. As Esau. He's real. He does. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. But it turns out he's faker than all get out because the truth is he sold his birthright. And we saw the problem with the promise and the birthright is they were intertwined. The main promise and the birthright, they worked together. It's like, salva it's like salvation and fruit. Or what was I what was, who was I talking to recently about? Well, last week, was it Sunday that I said it? I said salvation is dependent on belief, not... Oh, can't okay, remember what I said, my Sunday... Repentance. Yes, repentance. repentance doesn't lead to salvation. Salvation breeds repentance. So you repent because you've been saved. You don't repent to be saved. You believe to be saved. You repent because you're saved. The evidence of somebody being saved is they repent because they now realize they've sinned against the Holy God. And we went through a number of scriptures that show that this is that same type of concept. The blessing and the birthright. The birthright entailed the blessing. And they are conjoined. They work together. And we saw last week that the blessing that Isaac gave was that he, that he was going to rule over his brothers and so forth. And that's what he was going to give to Esau. Why was that a problem? Because God said that Jacob would rule over the brothers. And Jacob would be the prominent heir of Isaac's established fortune that he amassed. And that Jacob would be the one that takes it all, not Esau. So when he gets deceived, it turns out he ends up doing the will of God. Now, did Rebecca have to connive to get the will of God done? No. But she did, and we saw why that was a problem. And again, she loses her son for that. She'll never see him again. This is it. In chapter 28, verse 1, it says, So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Now, there are several reasons he says that. Reason number one, if you look back in chapter 27, verse 46, Rebecca, she's crying to Isaac. She hears that Esau is going to kill her boy, her baby, my love. Uh-oh. Your brother wants you dead. I got an idea. She goes to Isaac and says here at the end of verse 46. Well, I'm just going to read from the beginning. Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm tired of living because of the daughters of Het. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Het, like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be? Now I'm being dramatic. I'm dramatizing it because I'd imagine she sounded something like, okay, baby, I, I agree with you. Like, yeah, we don't want our son marrying these daughters. We saw that Esau had already married several of the daughters of Het, of the daughters of Canaan. And we saw, I believe this is at the end of chapter 26. Let's see. Yep, it says here, verse 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Biri, and uh, the Hittite, and Basmat, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. So it was already an issue. So one, she's beseeching her husband for her son more so because she doesn't want him killed. Get, go on, go to Haran, get to my brother Laban because if you don't, your brother's gonna kill you, bro. Just go. But there was another reason that was important for uh, Isaac not to allow Jacob to marry one of the daughters of the land of Canaan, of the daughters of the Hittite, of Het. And we talked about it last week. God gave a promise to Abraham and his promise was that he would flourish his seed. And through him, one would come that would be a blessing to the world, which is the scarlet you know, line that traces to Jesus. That's going to be the ultimate blessing that comes through that lineage. But in that, God also promised that he would remove the inhabitants of the land. All the people of Cain and all the Hittites, the Girgashites, the, you know, the whatever tights there are, all those tights that are in there, those, those tights, that are, you know, they're tight, but you know, it's a, get them on out. But uh, some people were supposed to laugh, but it's because I couldn't say the actual word without being scorned. You're tight. You know, but yeah, that's what they were. They were tights or ites. And God's going to remove all these lights, the, the ites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Ammonites, the Amorites, the, all these ites. And when he does that, who's it? The Jebusites. Yeah, the Jeb Jebus, and there are the Jebusites and Jebus. But the woke ites, all the ites, the termites, you know? <laughs> and he's going to remove all these people. And he's going to give that land to the descendants of Abraham, right? And that's his promise. We saw in Genesis 15, God tells Abraham, I want to give it to you now, but I can't. Why? He says, because the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. He says, so you and your descendants, you're going to go away for 400 years. And you're going to be enslaved to a harsh people. 
and I'm going to bring you out of that nation with a mighty hand, and I'm going to bring you in, and you're going to dispossess these people and take this land that I've given you. And he's going to use Israel to judge these nations, <coughs> and they're going to remove them. They're supposed to actually wipe them out, obliterate them, and we're going to see later on in life they fail at that. But that was what God told them. So this is the problem. If Jacob, who is of the lineage of promise, interbreeds now with Canaanite women and forms an alliance, because we saw in the last several chapters that marriage in these times was a way of, you know, when you get yourself a wife and you get to get busy, you know, you do the manly thing. But you also formed an alliance. And when two nations married their children off, they would now align and they would say, hey, we're family now. We don't fight each other. Now that's a massive problem because God promised to wipe those people out and to give that land to the inhabitants of the line of promise, which is going to be Jacob. But if Jacob marries into that land, God can't remove them and give them the land at the same time because they'd be unified. Those children would then be Jacob's children. So you, they, he should not and cannot take a wife from this land. So Isaac is probably thinking more along those lines. Send him that way for that. Yeah, you're right. We can't send him here. The daughters of Hat are bad. Go to Haran. Rebecca's real motive is, I just don't want you to die, baby. Go. Nonetheless, God's will is being accomplished. But in 28 verse 1, it says, So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. It says, You shall not take a wife from here, but rather go. Go take a wife from there. Do as your mother has said. Do, do what she said. It says, good, go. But it says that he blessed him before he charged him to go. And I find that very interesting that he blesses Jacob. After Jacob knowingly deceived him. And it appears that Isaac now is in conjunction with God's will. We talked about it last week. It's very likely that Rebecca relayed to Isaac, Babe, God, I, I inquired of God, remember? Yeah. What did he say? Well, he said that there's two nations in me. I don't know what he means. Two nations. What that means, I don't know. But he said the younger will serve the older. And then they have twins. And remember it says, whoa, they were shocked that there were twins. Which means they, they may, not have, it may not have been something they had ever seen or was so uncommon that they had not yet seen it. And they didn't realize what God was saying. But when the twins come, they were shocked. Like, whoa, there's twins. And Jacob came out holding Esau's hill. And they called him Jacob because he's a hill catcher. He's a supplant, a supplanter, a deceiver. And so, what's up, little guy? That's called worship, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When babies do that, we just call that worship, and we let them worship. Mm -hmm. But, so he's called Jacob, and I'm sure Rebecca was on it, like, oh my goodness. This is our boy, Jacob. God said he would rule. And I'm sure in Isaac's mind, he's like, that's not how it goes. Because in their culture, the firstborn got the birthright. That's how it went. If you're born first, you get the birthright if you're male. You get the blessing if you're born first. These are just add-ons that you get for being born first. You know, you just you get hooked up. That extra measure, that extra weight. Now, could the blessing be passed off to other people? Yes. And when we get to the end of Genesis, we're going to see that when Jacob dishes out his blessings, they're going to split all kinds of weird ways. And he does it for very obvious reasons, and we'll see why later. But in this case, I'm sure Isaac thinking, why would God give the blessing? You must have heard wrong, Rebecca. So when it comes time to give out the, well, first with the birthright, we saw that Esau scorned his birthright, and he sold it. He was hungry. He wanted a bowl of stew and said, oh, brother, kind of like his mom, I'm dying. Give me a bowl of stew, and I'll give you my birthright. And he said, give me a bowl of stew, and Jacob says, give me your birthright. Take it. What good is it to me if I'm dead? Dramatic, a drama boy. And so, as manly as he is, some manly men are dramatic, like drama queens. But he was one of those. So just take it or I'm going to die. And so he takes the birthright, which... God already said would be his. But later, Isaac, uh, Isaac, when he goes to bless Esau, Esau comes and he thinks he's going to get the blessing. He gave his birth right away, but the blessing is mine. Not so much, buddy. Not so much. And Isaac was willing to go out of the will of God and bless Esau in spite of what Rebekah likely told him. There's no reason not to think that Rebekah didn't share that information with him, that the younger would be ruler over the older and that the older would serve the younger. But here Isaac is about to just totally contradict the will of God. And yet, Jacob ends up with a blessing. Well, here according to verse 1 and 2, it appears that Isaac has accepted the fact that Jacob is the blessed one. Because it says that he blessed him and charged him 
and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram to the house of Betuel, your mother's father. And from there, take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And this is where it really shows that it appears Isaac got on board in verse 3. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a people, a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you that you may possess the land of your sojournings which God gave to Abraham. Isaac says, I'm sold. You know, she told me it and it happened that God has chosen the younger. I'm going to bless you, my son. Go get a daughter, a wife from the daughters of Haran of, of, from Laban because these women now, they're not for you. Now, it says that he blessed him with the blessing of Abraham. That is that blessing of promise. That is that, that very thing that God promised Abraham. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bring multitudes of peoples and kings from you. And I'm going to give you all this land. So known as the Abrahamic covenant. And when Abraham passed, that covenant was transferred to Isaac. And he received the same blessing. And that was initially to revert to Esau, which it skipped him for reasons we've already talked about. So now that blessing rests on Jacob. So now Jacob is of the lineage of promise, which in God's vernacular always was and is. But we're going to see that the Messiah will come from this nation. When we think of Jacob, you're going to want to have another name in mind. And we'll probably I think, get into it I think next week or the week after. Israel. Jacob and Israel are one and the same. Now, there is a very poetical picture of the two of them. Whenever we see Jacob mentioned in Scripture, we're, we're often dealing with the deceptive one, with the deceiver, the, the, the hill catcher. And whenever he's mentioned as Israel, God's fighter or God's prince, it's referring to Jacob having encountered God and now walking right with the Lord. Because even throughout the Old Testament, sometimes the prophets would prophesy, and when they were speaking really bad about Israel, they'd say, Jacob. And to be called Jacob was like a slap in the face because he's no longer Jacob. He was renamed Israel by God. And that's his name, Israel. But right now, he's just a dirty old Jacob. And you know, he's, he's sending him off and he's giving him the blessing. And in verse 5, it says, Then Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Badan Aram to Laban, the son of Betuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now, Padanaram, just, just a quick note, because, I mean, I at least had this question, so I'd imagine one or two of you might. Padanaram and Haran, same place. Padanaram was likely just a subsection somewhere in Haran. Think Westgate, Albuquerque. West Side, Albuquerque. Northeast Heights, Albuquerque. You get the picture, though. So it was likely, Padanaram was likely a subsection of Haran. Or vice versa. I didn't really look that deep into it. But it's the same place. So he's still going off to Haran. And he sends him away. Now in verse 6 and then the next four verses, we're going to see something interesting. And we're going to just see a little snippet of Esau. And it's just a mention in passing. But the Bible talks about it, so we're going to talk about it. Now we know Esau has been... I don't want to use the word duped. Esau wasn't duped. Let's make something clear. First and foremost, God said beforehand that Jacob was going to be the ruler. Period. It was that set in stone. If God said it, it will be accomplished. Secondly, remember last week when Esau's talking to Isaac after he finds out that Isaac basically hijacked the blessing? That that deceiver son of yours, he 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 duped me out of my birthright and, and now he's taking the blessing. And the truth is, did he dupe him out of the birthright? He made him a, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a fair offer, but, you know, I got two kids and sometimes they make trades that are pretty stupid. And all I have to say is, did you trade him? Yeah, well, then you're out of luck, bro. What do you want from me? <laughs> you, if you traded something off and you got a bad deal, that was on you. You should have come to us first and said, hey, is this a good deal? And I'd have said yes or no. And if you made a bad deal, that's on you. When I was a kid for Easter, my grandma, you know, she, she used to hide eggs and stuff. And I remember one year I found a, a yellow egg, the gold egg, but it was yellow. But I was like five, so, you know, everybody wanted the eggs with money in them. There's nothing in there. I thought it was just a, a, a jacked egg, you know, it was just a trick egg. And my brother, he goes, ch -ch 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 -ch. I'll trade you. You know, I think I, I thought I was getting the high, the high deal here because this is empty. There's like a 20 in there. I got a dollar fifty in quarters, and he got like a ten or a twenty. Of course, I wanted my egg back, and 
I traded my brother. That was, I was on my part. I should have opened that egg up first. But yeah. es Esau comes and he trades off his birthright. He didn't get duped. He was just being emotional. And now that the blessing is gone, again, I'm sure he was well aware of the fact that Jacob was going to be his master also. There's no reason not to believe he didn't also know this. And it's likely that he fully understood well that the birthright and the blessing are intertwined. Nonetheless, we see Esau here now. He's peeping on in, dad talking to Jacob. Verse 6, now Esau saw that Isaac blessed Jacob. Now you know that had to hurt because he's blessing him again. Remember last week, dad, do you not have another blessing for me? And wow, wow, pretty much. And he doesn't very much bless him. He kind of like it's not so much a cursing, but it's it's definitely not a blessing. He tells him you're gonna be in a place that's dry and barren, and life's gonna suck for you. <laughs> so like a cursing, you know. Now here he is blessing Jacob again, and what Isaac is technically doing is just reaffirming the blessing to him, but nonetheless blessing. And we talked about the importance of blessing our children, but it said that. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take to himself a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And we saw why that is so important that the lineage of the chosen, the chosen line not marry into the daughters of Canaan. God is going to remove those people. And he's going to establish their children there. Can't do that if that's them. Verse 7, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac, and Esau went to Ishmael and married besides the wives that he had. That he had. Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaiot. So Esau sees that Isaac is blessing him and sending him off to get a wife that's not the daughters of Canaan. She's probably thinking, oh, just, I married two of them. <sighs> I know how I'll fix this. I'll marry a third wife. Jeez. This time, I'll take a daughter of Ishmael. It's not the daughters of Canaan. I'll take a daughter of Ishmael. Ha <laughs> ha! Then maybe dad will bless me. Well, we don't hear much of anything happening, so we don't really know what transpires with this. We're going to see Esau in a couple chapters and it's going to be brief and then he's going to just kind of disappear off of the scriptures but we don't really know what happens what I will say is this there are those who are not biblically grounded who will see things like this and say hmm well Esau had multiple wives you know when I keep reading David married like seven or eight chicks Solomon he married 300 and he had 700 concubines Concubine with somebody you slept with on the side. That dude had enough women for two chicks a year. <laughs> and every month throwing a couple extras. And you still have some girls left over. That's a lot of women. That's pretty gross. But that was Solomon. Y'all, oh, look at all these men. Maybe I can marry multiple wives. And the answer is no, you can't do that. I mean, you can, but you cannot walk right with God and do that. That's, that's, at that point, it's called adultery. The woman that you make your vows to first, that's your wife. And unless you have an actual nullification or a certificate of, of divorce, a, a dissolution of marriage, you are married. And to marry outside of your marriage is adultery. That's what that is. Just because something is recorded in the Word of God does not mean... That God is in wholehearted approval of it. And that is a common mistake that people make. What the Bible does for us is the Bible records history. It's a historical document. So if God is truth, we'd expect nothing less from the document of his word to be truthful. So what the Bible does is it says, hey, this happened. And that's one of the evidences of the validity of the Word of God, is it's not just this fixed little document that caters to our desires, our wants, and our needs, and gives us strength and power. It shows the whole flaw of humanity, good and bad, as well as God's redemptive plan and work. So like an example, if you wanted a hero, you don't crucify him. I mean, in our case, he rises again, which is excellent, but... 
Or David, if you want a hero, you don't put him doing something like sleeping with a bunch of wives. If you want to hear like another good one, women, I love you guys, but in Jesus' day, you were considered not good. I'm sorry. That's what it is. Like you, A woman's testimony was like that of a drug addict. Maybe lower. And I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's the society that they lived in. And in the biblical case, do you know who was the first at the tomb of the risen Savior? A bunch of women. You know who was at the cross? Women. women. And in a story that you want to be flourishing, you're not going to make that up. You're going to be like, yeah, all the dudes are there. The men, show, the men ran away like a bunch of little weenies. And that's one of the evidences that the word of God is true because it's not about recording what we want to hear. It's about this is what happened. Believe it or not, this is what happened. I don't like the way that sounds. That's okay because this is what happened. And so when it says that Esau took multiple wives, this isn't our certificate to go marry or cheat. This is just recording Esau's stupidity. Yeah. That's all. That's what this is. And when some of these other guys marry multiples, it's not an okay to go marry. It's simply recording these men's stupidity. That's all it is. So realize that the Word of God is going to record the truth regardless of our feelings and regardless of the historical viewpoints, good or bad. It's simply like a camera. One of the things I love about cameras is you can't really debate them because it's not taking sides. It's just recording what happened. So I love cameras. For that reason, we have cameras in the church. Why? Because if something ever happens, I don't want people's testimony. Let's just pull up the camera. Camera tell us everything that happened. It's not going to be biased. It's not going to take sides. It's going to say, this is what happened. That's what the Bible does. It's a camcorder on history that says... This is what happened. So that's Esau. Now we get to verse 10 and we pan the camera back to Jacob. Now this is where it gets really interesting. In verse 10 it says, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Now Beersheba was down in the Negev where Isaac was living, where they were all living. So he's coming down from far north, uh, uh, south of Israel, and he's coming on up. Because Haran is, uh oh, because Haran is, come on in. Come on in. Because her, uh oh, still David. Because Haran, it's all right, I like the spooky sounds. <laughs> wrong month, though, wrong month. We're about four months away, uh, four months past Halloween. <laughs> but if you're online, his, his spooky sounds are making noise. But if you go up north, Haran is way up past the King's Highway. Remember, we have Mesopotamia way over here in all this land here in the east. And this is all that rich culture. And there's that king's road that comes all the way up to the top of the Mediterranean and then shoots on down to Egypt. And all right here along the Mediterranean coast is Canaan, what will be Israel. Down here in the bottom section is where Isaac is. He's sending his son up because he's going to come up to Haran. But he stops mid-center, what we call Israel today, but Canaan at that time. And he stops in this place. It says here in verse 10, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. So it says he stopped in a certain place. We know what place this is because in verse 19 it tells us it's Luz. Now it doesn't appear that he went into the city. Now do you guys know why he turned off, parked, and crashed out? It tells us because it was dark. Because the sun set. And so once the sun sets, it's not like walking down an Albuquerque street. When the sun sets, we got these lights. We can I'm keep on walking. Yeah. You, if you're in the mountain, have you ever been in the mountains and the sun sets? Especially if the moon's not full or it's not out and bright. It gets really dark. And it's easy to fall into a hole. Or I'll show you one time, you know, I was on top of the petroglyphs. And it was nighttime. We are at a friend's house. And there's like 15 of us. And... We were at the top, and she lived on those houses right there at the bottom. And so we all decided we're going to run down the hill, or we're going to come down so you can get down faster. So I'm going to be the fastest. That was dumb. You know why? Because I jumped on a rock that wasn't stable. Yeah, that wasn't fun for my ankle. No, I'm a tough dude, so I rocked it off. But it hurt. But I couldn't let everybody see that it hurt because I'm... I'm too much of a tough guy for that. But the truth is, if I had to fight somebody in that moment, I might have gotten my butt whooped because I didn't have a whole lot to stand on because my ankle was killing me. Yeah, it sucked. That's what happens when you try to walk, move, or run in the dark. 
you can't see or you can't see well. So what you did if you're traveling is the sunset. The goal is always to get to a city, to get within the city gates because that's going to usually be the safer place. If you don't make it, you got to pull off to the side and just camp out. Now, if you didn't make it to a city gate before they shut it, you're camping out. So it's also likely that he just decided to pull over because once the gates shut, they're shut. The city didn't reopen their gates till the next morning. So if you don't make it into the city by the time gate closed, well, you're just out. So it doesn't say he made it to the gates and it doesn't say he didn't. But the appearance seems to be that he didn't fully make it, but he's right there. But whatever, fine. But it says he came to a certain place. He turned aside and where am I here? Came to a certain place and spent the night there. Why? Because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and he lay down in that place. Now he takes a stone and he makes it his pillow. I don't get it. But whatever, like, you know, I'd use my hands or something or I'd roll up a, a wine skin or I don't know. I could think, think of a million different things I'd rather do than put a rock under my head. But maybe it was a you know rock shaped like his head or something. I don't know. But, you know, he throws a rock on his head and he's, that's his pillow. Whatever. That's cool. No, again, I have no clue why, why, but again, the Bible is simply recording the data. That's what he did. Verse 12 says, He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now, this is where I went crazy, and you're going to see why here. I'm going to introduce some things to you that are really theological. They're going to be probably confusing to most of you but bear with me but firstly we're going to look jacob has this dream and he it says he sees this ladder the hebrew word for ladder is sulam and the more appropriate interpretation rather than ladder is going to be a staircase there's a staircase and on this staircase angels are going up and down it now it says that this staircase went up into heaven now, this is where it gets really important, something that we want to understand. Throughout most of, at least, human history as far as, I mean, even in the Jews' time, heaven has always been considered this place of God's dwelling, right? When we die, we're going to go to, that's what we're taught. And you know, as I've studied this, i got some serious reserves and questions. You're going to see why, and to a degree, sure. But, biblically, there are three heavens. And in some cases, depending on your, your source, maybe more. But there are three common heavens that biblical scholars would agree on and are aware of. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's talking about a guy that he knew, speaking of himself, who went to the third heaven. And you're probably thinking, well, what do you mean there's multiple heavens? Heaven... I'll just tell you what the three heavens are. The first heaven is this, and this is how the ancients understood it. The first heaven is the atmosphere. It's where the birds flew. For us, the planes fly. It's, it's everything within our atmosphere. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is going to be what we call space. It's going to be that place where the stars and the moons and the planets exist, the stellar, the stellar universe, where it all is. That's the second heaven. The third heaven is different. It's not seen. And the third heaven is where God dwells. I once heard it said that an astronaut went to heaven, an atheist, and said, well, I was in heaven. I was up in the sky. I was way up in space. And, you know, I didn't see heaven, so it must not exist. And somebody replied, take off your helmet and you'll see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the third heaven is not visible to our naked eye unless God reveals it to us. Now, I bring this up for a reason. There's a Hebrew scholar by the name of Tim Mackey, and he refers to the third heaven as God space. And I'm going to explain to you what God space is, and I think it's a more appropriate term than heaven. God space is where the presence of God dwells. And when we're looking at God space, or heaven, we call it heaven, but God space, it has several other names in the scripture. We call it heaven. It's called the kingdom of heaven. It's also referred to as eternal life in the scriptures. These three things, and there's more, there's more but these are three examples that refer to being in the presence of God. Remember when Jesus says, the kingdom of God is upon you. 
That's to say God's space is upon you. God's presence is upon you. Now, there was also another space. It's called earth space. It's, that's our space. That's the realm that we exist in. We call it earth. We call it the present age or the age of sin and death. And there are more names for it in scripture, but those are three examples of it. Now, there was one point in history where God's space, where God's presence was, and man's space were one and they were unified. That was in the Garden of Eden. When God created humanity, this was the intention, for us to be unified with him. Man flipped the bird to God and said, eh, we don't want to do it your way. We were supposed to walk in unison with God. We were to walk in conjunction with God. And rather, man said, no, we're going to do it our way. And that's not exactly what they said, but that's what they did. And what happened is man's space separated from God space. And that's exactly what God said would happen. Remember, he said in the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll die. You will surely die. What is death? Separation. To separate. When one dies, the soul separates from the body. And Jesus says, blessed is the one who dies once. But the dude that dies twice, he doesn't say this, I'm paraphrasing now, but the dude that dies twice, nobody wants part in that second death. The first death, we separate from our souls from our body. The second death, our soul separates from God for eternity, who is life. But God's intention was never that we live outside of God's space. God's space was intended for us. We were to live in harmony with God. We blew that. And I know you say, well, I didn't. Adam and Eve did. Now nah, you did too. I'm going to tell you how you did. Every time any one of us sins, that's the same thing as taking a bite of that fruit and saying, to God. Every time we sin. Why? Because we defy God the same way they defy God. They had the command and they said, we're going to do it our way. We're going to eat this fruit. And what you going to do? You're going to die. Oh. What do we do? We have life and death set before us. Day in and day out. We have the choice to be obedient to God, to love our wives, and to raise our children, to not watch pornography, to not be drunk, to not live in dissipation, to not be vulgar, to not be bitter or angry with disputes. And how many of us choose to sin rather than to obey God? And every time we choose sin over God, we simply are agreeing that we would rather do it our way, not your way, God. But this God space, it was... In creation, it was at the beginning, and it was intended for us to be unified with God. And because of mankind's rebellion, the two were separated. Now, as history goes on, we see instances of God space. What is God space? The presence of God. What is God space? The presence of God. What is God space? I'll make sure you understand this. What is God space? One last time. What is God space? presence of God. That's the more appropriate term. Heaven, meh. The reason heaven is used is because the ancient looked up and they realized God was big and above all. So like he's somewhere way up there because he's God. But the truth is we use the word heaven, but God's space is a much better term because there are points where God's space meets earth. We're going to see it today. And in even in this day, there were places where God's space met earth. That's what temples were about. When a temple was built to a god, that was a point of meeting between that god's realm and earth. And it wasn't any different with Yahweh. Do you remember where he set up his temple? In Jerusalem. Well, first it was in the tabernacle, but then in Jerusalem. God erect, has them erect the temple there. He said, in the place that I choose for my name to dwell, that's where you're going to build that temple. And that was Jerusalem and under Solomon that was decreed, fulfilled, and done. And there the Spirit of the living God literally dwelt. Where the living God met earth. Right? God's space, where heaven meets earth. Or where God's space meets man's space. And that was where you went to go get atoned for. That's where you went to go intercede. That's where you went to do everything. That's where you went to meet God. This God space. It's very interesting. Because as we look forward into our time, that's reversed though 2,000 years into the time of Christ more appropriately. Jesus then comes. And do you know what Jesus' goal was and continues to be? 
to restore humanity to God's space. Everything Jesus has done and is continuing to do and will accomplish in the age to come is to reunite mankind or man's space to God's space and that we will one day live again in accordance with the way Eden was intended to live, but in a new way. Because the Bible says God is going to read, He's going to do away the heavens and the earth and recreate everything. But that's the concept. God still desires for us to live physically with Him. It's not to be some spiritual manifestation. It is a very physical thing. And when Jesus came, He came in the fullness of God. And He came in the fullness of man. He was fully God and fully man. And so at the point of Christ, humanity and heaven meet. And God's space is then embodied. Remember, Jesus even says, I am the, or John says it, and we said he's going to resurrect the temple. He was speaking about his body. Jesus is that place where God meets earth, where God meets man. More importantly, when we come to Christ and we accept him as our Lord and Savior, when we, when we believe on him, the Bible says, do you know what happens to you? Ephesians 1.13 says, you are sealed with the spirit of promise. The second you truly believe in the Lord, the Holy Spirit indwells you, or your mind, your heart. He comes inside and he makes a home in you. You are now grafted into the family of God. More, more than just the grafted into Israel, you're grafted into the family of God. The, John tells us you now have the right to be called a son of God, a child of God. You are grafted in, and you become a physical manifestation of God's space. That means where you are, if the Spirit of God lives in you, if He lives in you, where you are, God is manifested. The presence of God, because He lives inside of us. That's why we're called His hands and His feet. This is nuts, right? Like, this is stuff like, man, I've been on a mission studying this stuff, you guys. Like, I'm going to be going down some rabbit holes in the next couple months, like, between Heiser and Mackie, I'm on a mission. Like You guys have no idea. I've been excited because I've been praying for this type of a mission. And then God opened the doors for me because I like this kind of stuff. But this is stuff that's good for us to understand. That this is the Lord's desire. That he's creating these pockets of God's space or of heaven or the kingdom of God. Where God's people are, there his kingdom is. That's to say where God is, there God's space is. Where, where God's people are. Where God's people are, there is his presence. Where two or more gathered, he says, there he is in the midst. And here's the kicker. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and you're there, how many is that? That's two. And he's probably referring to physical people, but the fact is, if, if he's in you, and you're you, that's two. And if you get more, there he is in the midst. Either way, he's there in the midst if he's in you. But you are a manifestation of God's space. I find that absolutely astounding. And this is God's continued plan that he's going to reunite man's space with God's space that heaven and earth so to speak will unify as one and that's what is that's our hope that is what's to come in the book of revelation when you get to the end that's what he's talking about the reunification of humanity to God and we're going to live in a similar aspect as they did in the garden just different but we're going to be where God is which is God space it's where the presence of God is mind-boggling, mind-blowing. And so from now on, you're going to hear me use that word God space. That means I'm referring to heaven or the presence of God because it's a more appropriate term. Now it says here that in verse 12, he had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on earth or a staircase. Now it's very likely that Jacob is seeing a temple. And it would be likely, have you guys ever seen like those temples in Mexico or in, you know, they have those huge staircases that go up to the top? That's the idea that there's a huge staircase that goes up to the top of a temple. And that's the idea. And it says, angels were ascending and descending on it. And behold, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. And I'm going to stop there because I'm going to still talk about verse 12. But who's at the top of this staircase or at the top of this temple? Christ. Yahweh, God is. Jacob says, Whoa! Now exactly what he saw, it doesn't say he saw a space or anything, but whatever he saw, whoa, God's up there. Holy smokes. So again, he has this vision, this dream of this temple, and it says angels were ascending and descending. And that's to indicate that there's a connecting point between God's space and man's space. This is a place where God interacts with man. That's what a temple was about. The interaction of a God and humanity. 
whatever God you believed in. False gods, no real thing happened. With the true and living God, there was a real interaction with the temple and humanity with God. Now, what makes this even more interesting, you don't have to turn there, but if you were to go to John chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus sees Nathanael, and he says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael goes, How do you know me? You don't know me. He says, I know you. I'm paraphrasing. He says, Before you were under the fig tree, or while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, for us, that sounds stupid because it's like, well, anybody could have seen him under a fig tree, except it's obvious that wherever he was, nobody could have seen him because he was in an isolated place where there's no way anybody could have seen him. That'd be like Jesus saying, when you were in your shower, I saw you. It's a little creepy, but you know, <laughs> but can you imagine if, 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 can you imagine if somebody said that to you and nobody knew that you were even in a shower, but he saw you and he describes what you were doing. What? Nathaniel's mind gets blown and he goes, my Lord and my God. He's baffled and he confesses him and says, Lord, you are the one we have been waiting for. And Jesus looks at him and says, are you impressed by that? He says, Nathaniel, follow me and you're going to see greater things. He says, you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Right back to Genesis 28. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? For the mind of the ancient, they understood this. God space. The place where heaven and earth meet. So the Son of Man is going to bring God down, so to speak. So essentially, the Son of Man is going to be the meeting place of God. And for us, we understand that because the Son of Man is God. Mm -hmm. And not only is He God, He's man. But He is the embodiment of God and the embodiment of man and he both occupies man's space and God's space hence the Bible says he's ruler of the heavens and the earth it's all his he's the king of kings lord of lords it is all his all rule power dominion authority it's his and there's a lot in there that I've been learning that deals with a lot of spiritual authorities demonic things but we'll get to that in another time but Jesus becomes the embodiment of where God meets earth so he says, like that temple from Genesis 28 where God met with earth, that's me now. You're going to see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Yeah. That is incredible. You guys, I mean, if that isn't blowing your mind, then we need to study more. Yeah. Because that should be blowing your mind. Because at Christ, heaven and earth meet. And again, when we, again, when we put our faith in Him, we become little embodiments of God's space because God's Spirit now dwells in you. His presence is in you. That is incredible to think. That is actually baffling to think. That we are... I'm not going to get into that because I want to finish. I've got about 12 minutes and the goal is to finish tonight. But it says in verse 13, And behold, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. And God meets him at this very intimate place and says, Behold, I am the God of your father Abraham. Now there is no doubt Isaac is so aware of what happened because there is no doubt Isaac has relayed everything to Jacob and probably Esau, everything that God spoke to Abraham. I'm sure Abraham gave it all to Isaac and said, Son, let me tell you all that God did. Do, 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 do. Passed it on down. Isaac takes everything, passes it on down to his son, and now here God is, he's getting it first hand. Whoa, Dad told me about all of this. You're the God of my father Abraham and my father Isaac, and now you're calling me? I wonder if Jacob was shocked that he was being called. What was Jacob? He was a deceiver. We would call him today, he's a sinner. And God is meeting him where he is and revealing himself to him in a very intimate and incredible and unique way. And I would imagine Jacob is just dismayed and we're going to see he was terrified. I want to share with you the typical reaction of somebody who interacts with God like this. It's never this, ah, it's always this terrifying tremble. We talked about it, I think, Sunday. Remember I told you guys about that lady who was a prophet and how the prophet said she saw the face of Jesus. And I said, maybe. And then she said, I saw the face of our father. And I said, you're a liar. You're a straight liar. Oh, yeah, me and the father playing. He's so kind. And I'm like, bro, if you saw the, fa the father's face, you would die. Yeah. Even in a vision, 
if you, nobody sees the, Jesus said, no one has seen the Father but me. And I give to you everything he's given to me. I would say entertaining. I'll go that far. I told her straight up. I told her, you, you really want to play prophet? You want to play prophet? Because the Bible says that if you're a false prophet, to drag you out the city and stone you. You still want to be a prophet? She was real quiet. And I said, okay, we won't kill you, but I just, I just want you to know, that's the biblical... <laughs> you know, I told her though, that's the biblical mandate. Realize. <laughs> don't, if you're watching online, don't be stoning false prophets. Just pray for her. Yeah. But that is the biblical mandate. Realize that. No, don't stone them, please. Like, just pray for them and love them, and maybe God will, you know, pray for their salvation and pray for their humility, and that God will humble them. But when Jay, we're gonna see that Jacob is terrified after what he has experienced, because that's the typical reaction of somebody who's experienced God. As a matter of fact, can we all remember when we came to Christ? It of, often comes with fear, trembling, and tears. Of, I mean, of what we were, who we, depending on your experience. But I mean, some people come to Christ and they're super joyful, but most people are broken. Because we realize what we've done against the Holy God. There's joy but tears. Tears because we know what we are and what we've done. And joy at the same time because God has saved us. I'm not saying when you come to Christ you're not, but yay, maybe. I really have some serious questions about that salvation, but maybe. Because one of the things, blessed are the poor in heart. That's the first blessed. Why? Because the poor in heart realize their spiritual depravity. They realize that we have completely corrupted and, and gone against the holy living God and we're on our way to hell good news Jesus died for our sins Woo! we believe man repent now forgive me Lord for what I've done you repent because you believe but that's that's the, the essence here but I'm just getting off to track verse 13 and behold Yahweh stood above it and said I am Yahweh the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. He establishes the covenant that was already established by the blessing of Isaac. God is now affirming that promise. And I'd imagine Jacob is shocked. What? Probably thinking, yeah, it's really not going to come true. You know, I'm a deceiver, I'm a terrible little dude. But here God is now showing up to establish that very covenant that he promised with Abraham was given to Isaac. And now it's reverting to Jacob. Verse 14. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now this is what we call the scarlet thread through scripture. So he gives them that same promise that Abraham has given. Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you massive amounts of descendants. Kings will come from you. I'm going to give you this land here. And... Through you, the world is going to be blessed. That is a direct reference to the Messiah to come. Because through the Messiah, he's going to break down all walls, all, all barriers. There is no man and there is no woman. There is no Jew. There is no Greek. There is no barbarian. There's no Scythian. There is one in Christ now. And anybody who believes enters into that what Jeremiah 31 31 says is the new covenant and we become physical representations of God space we become the kingdom of God so if you're born again you're the kingdom of God if you're not born again well you're just hanging out in church get born again I don't know how to get born again believe on Jesus who died for your sin and resurrected and now sits at the right hand of the Father. Believe It's a simple belief. Believe what he did. I do. Well, then you're born again, bro. Now walk in it. Live it. Don't just be born again and because then you got to wonder, were you really born again? If you believe but you don't live it, then I, I got serious reservations on whether or not you believe because somebody who believes is going to live it. If I wrote you a million dollar check and you believe I had the money to back it up, you'd be at the bank trying to cash it. <laughs> That would tell me you you have way more faith in me than well, thank you, you know, because yeah, I don't have the money to back that up. I don't even know if I could back up a five thousand dollar check, you know, like. But if you got that check and tore it up, that tell me you don't you don't stand by my word. You don't think I have the money to back it up, and you're probably smart for that at this particular moment in my life. So you know, don't go try to cash it because you ain't getting jack, you know. 
But that's the essence of belief. It, the works accompany belief because you believe. Now, he tells him here that he's going to receive this land, north, south, east, and west. It's yours. He establishes that same covenant as he did with Abraham and Isaac. In 15, it says, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you, and leave. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. He promises him, Jacob, I've promised you this, and I will not leave you until all is accomplished. That's in essence to say, Jacob, I am with you for good. I'm not going to forsake you, Jacob. I am with you. Now, can you imagine having that promise from God? Wait, you do. The Bible says that he will not leave or forsake you. Did you know that we're the ones that leave and forsake him? Whenever you feel far from God, it's very simple. God, is, God remains established. He is where he's always been. The problem with us is we wander off. And we're so smart that we don't know how to get back. But the truth is, it's as simple as repent and return. I don't remember where I came from. You do. In Revelation, when he's talking to, I believe it's the church of Ephesus, they're smart. Oh, they're so smart. You know, there's a danger with too much knowledge. I'll be honest with you. Knowledge is good. But the Bible also says knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. If it's knowledge and there isn't love accompanied, you're wrong. And I'll tell you how I know because that was me for a long time. Knowledge isn't bad, but love is more important than knowledge. Again, Paul said, knowledge puffs up. Means that's not a good thing. It makes you proud and prideful. Love, however, builds up. Love builds. And where there's nothing but knowledge, I can show, I'll show you a trail of disaster. Where there's love, I'll show you a trail of built work. And if you got them both, all the better. Like, we don't want to be stupid in Christ, by all means. We want to be smart. God has given us His Word to know Him and to use in His example and to, to use as, as strength and to use in our daily lives. And we want to be wise and smart. But we don't want to ever put love beneath knowledge. I don't know why I'm talking about knowledge, but it has to do with something I, I said here a moment ago, but I don't remember what it was. Oh, he is with him. When we walk away from God, the truth is getting back is simple. And, and in Revelation, he's talking to Ephesus. And he says, you guys are smart. You guys do everything good and right. And he says, but I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. Not lost, left. So he tells him how to get back. He says, repent. Return, redo. Repent from where you have fallen. Return and do the deeds you did at first. So if you have walked away from God and you're struggling, this is what you do. Repent from where you have fallen. Return and do the deeds you did when you were walking strong with God. And grow from there. It's simple. We just make it complicated. But here God tells him, I'll never leave you. Not until everything's accomplished. That's to say, I'll never leave you or forsake you. It's that same biblical concept. Verse 16, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely Yahweh is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. He woke up shocked and afraid. He said, Whoa. This is the house of God, and he names it that. Bet-El. We say Bethel, but it doesn't exist in Hebrew. I don't know why we... St I know why we stick in there, because in Hebrew, the H goes... So we see B-E-T-H. Bet-El means house of God. Bethel is just the white boy way of saying it. It's the Anglicized, yeah. Hebrew is Bet-El. bet lehem. Bet means house. Lehem means bread. Or we say Bethlehem. And if you ever hear me doing a genealogy and we come to Kiryath Jerim, I'll say Kiryat Yarim. Because the J doesn't exist in Hebrew either. It's a Y. And I can't stand the way Kiryath Jerim sounds. It sounds stupid. But the proper pronunciation is Kiryat. Kiryat Yarim. So it's not Beth L, it's Bet L. And that's what he names this place, the house of God. And in verse 17 it says, 
This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. That's to say, this is God's space. This is where heaven meets earth. This is where God interacts with man. It's, it's right here. Now, they didn't fully understand the omniscience of God. They believed that you met with God at a temple. There was a gate or some temple that was erected where you would go and you'd meet with your God, or even in this case, the living God. This is the gate of heaven. This is where God is. We understand that God transcends this. That God is everywhere always. We understand that God's space is wherever God is, which is, He can be anywhere He wants. Now the manifestation of His presence, again, is His people. And so the gate of heaven, or God's space, or the kingdom of God is where you are. And I can't stress that enough. And I can't tell you how much I love saying that. I'm going to keep saying that because I just love it. And I'm going to keep reiterating it because the more you hear it, the more it's going to stick. But the gate of heaven is now where you are. Can you, can you imagine that you can be the manifestation of God to somebody tomorrow? I'll show you how it works. You go and pray for somebody and they may say something like, man, I've been begging God to show me that. And he used you. Now we don't get the credit. God gets the credit because he, because he lives in us, uses us. When I'm up here teaching, if God uses me, God gets the credit. Because it's him using me. We don't ever want to worship the temple. Temple is just a temple. But the God of the temple, he's worth worshiping. Now, yes, verse 18 says, So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He takes that stone and says, he wrecks it and he pours oil on it. Now this stone acts as several things. It acts as an altar. He pours out his oil, which is an, a type of offering, and he's offering it to God. The oil. Now, there's no sacrificial system, so it's, there's not a prescribed way to offer or worship. This is just a common thing that you would do in that day. He offers oil, which was something of value. He's giving God a sacrifice, an offering. This pillar also stands as a memorial. The house of God. He poured oil on it, and he called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously, the name of that city had been Luz. Verse 20, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey, that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then Yahweh will be my God. Jacob makes a vow. Now, at first, the vow seems kind of petty, like, God just showed up to you and you're going to make a vow that if God but realize what Jacob is doing he's agreeing with God Lord you said you would do this I'm going to believe you and if you keep your word you'll be my God so he's not saying he's rejecting it it's not like an if I mean it is because he's saying if but he's in essence agreeing with God like if you do this as you said you would and you provide my needs Lord not as greed. Notice what he asked. If you provide my shelter, my lodging, and my food, and my clothes, if you give me what I need, and you bring me back to this place, as you have said, I'm yours. You said you'd do it. Do it, Lord. And I'm yours. In essence, he's agreeing with God. Now, you could look at it in a negative connotation and be like, he should just believe. In I'm here to tell you sometimes when God talks, sometimes it's hard to believe. When God called us to go to Santa Fe, I was like, oh, Santa Fe, what do you want with me up there? A bunch of dirty Santa Fans. <laughs> there's a there's a real tension between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. I'm just gonna let you know they don't like us and we don't like them for the most part. I love you guys though, but it's just what it is, and it's not the people. It's just the idea of we think we're better than them and they think they're better than us. Does anybody in here disagree? No. I know you don't because it's the truth. It's the same, and it's the same. It's the same with every other city. When you somebody. <laughs> is it the same way in jail? Yeah, if you're if you're in Santa Fe, we're from Las Lunas. You know, yeah. Oh, Espanol is even worse. So a la moda. Yeah, that's that's the hood of New Mexico. You know, Espanol. That's just that's like the Westgate of Albuquerque. But, but that's like the war zone, even you know. But but my point is though. I don't even remember what my point was. There was a point somewhere in there. I don't remember what that point was, but it was in there. But this pillar that he builds, and he, he, in essence, calls on God and says, if you bring me back to this place, Lord, I am yours. He's agreeing with him that I trust you. 
Oh, like I was saying, sometimes it's not easy to trust God. When God called us to Santa Fe, it didn't make sense. So we went. God did an incredible work in me. And then the church did good, and then it did bad, and then it did good, and then it did bad, then it did good, then it did bad. Then it got shut down because it was time to shut it down, and we came back. All broken tail between the legs, defeated is how I felt. And then God used circumstances to start a church here. And then boom, now here are all you people. And tonight, there's more people in this service, and we were missing a bunch of people still, but there are more people in this service than our biggest day in Santa Fe. And so I see what God is doing here, and it's incredible to watch hungry people show up for the Word of God. Was it hard to trust Him? Yes. Did it make sense? No. So I understand where Jacob's coming from. Lord, do what you said, and I'm yours. This is his first personal interaction with God. It's not like he's a mature believer. This is his first encounter with God. But he says in verse 22, This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So he makes this vow. He says, Lord, you promised to bless, do it, and so forth. And you're going to bring me back. Do it. And I'm yours. And I'll tell you what. Bring me back. I'll give you a tenth of all that you give me. We call that a tithe. That's where the word tithe comes from, a tenth. Now, something I want you guys to understand about the tithe. In Christianity, no tithe is commanded. Whoa, 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 Malachi. No, it's not for you. That was to the Jews. And when Malachi prophesied that, it was to the nation of Israel because they had a system set up where tithes were to be offered. And they were neglecting the tithe and God sent his prophet to rebuke the nation and say, hey, you're robbing yourself. I've commanded this, and I said, if you do it, I'll open up the storefronts of the store windows of heaven. I'll pour out blessings on you that you can't contain. Now, I know we try to make that about us, but the truth is, that's not for us. However, there is a principle that lies in there. The church should be a giving body. I follow the system of a tithe. I tithe. My wife, we tithe. You don't have to tithe. The Bible doesn't say we have to tithe. The Bible commands in the New Testament that what we give... We ought to give with a joyous heart. Some people give 1%. Some people give 50%. Some people give no percent. The Bible says whatever you give, do with a joyous heart. I would tell you this. If you're going to put a dollar in our agape box and it's bugging you like, oh, I don't want to give, I would say just take that dollar, roll it up, and stick it back in your pocket. <laughs> don't give. Like if, if you give begrudgingly, keep it. If you give with a joyous heart, then let that be a blessing from God and allow God to bless you through that. I'm convinced God blesses those who have open hands. It's like Kurt said earlier. We take Jesus and we go, I thought he was going to go a different route. Often we come to Jesus also and we do this. Yes. I ain't letting go of anything. Yeah. You know what the problem is with, op with closed hands? You can't take what God is trying to give you because your hands are open. Open your hands. I struggle with this. I'm convinced that's why God always lets my wife come up on money and not me. <laughs> yeah, all the time. She gets blessed. But she'll like get like a $10,000 check or some stupid thing. I'm like, what about me? So you know? And I'm like, chop liver, bro. Like, what the heck? Because oftentimes, I, I struggle with that. You know what I do when I get money? First thing I think? <laughs> Harley. <laughs> I'm like, buy. I'm a new bike. That's, that's, I'm dead honest. That new watch. That's what's on my mind. You know what my wife thinks usually when she gets, she wants to take care of business and let's give to God and let's do. And I mean, I want to give to God too. Don't get me wrong, but I'm convinced that's why God blesses her more than He blesses me. Which I mean, it comes into the same house, but nonetheless. And I've learned be open-handed with things. And it's okay. And let God be God, and let's just let Him be God. And if He brings in, we'll send out. If He brings in, we'll send out. And if we have needs, He'll meet them. But I'm here to tell you the church can't operate if people don't give. Yeah. I, I wish I could I wish I could tell you that this building was free and the people love us so much they just want us to have free rent. And yeah. PM says, Oh, you're a church doing the will of God, let us give you free electricity. Yeah, if we don't pay rent or bills, you know what they do? Shut them off and kick us out. The real yeah. The reality is is the church can't operate without willing people that are willing to give. No, do you have to give a tithe? No, you don't. Can you? I think the tithe is an excellent blueprint. Yeah, it's a, it is a heart check. It's an excellent blueprint. 
And what it is, is, is it's you saying, God, it's all you. When you get paid, the first thing you should say is, God, it's yours. Because I'm yours. Yep. And what would you have me do? Now, if you've got bills, that's an obvious. Pay your bills. And if you pay your bills and don't have anything to give, I would say, don't give. When we were in Santa Fe, there was this little old lady, the sweetest lady in the world. And she had two, two of her daughters came to church. One of them was our worship leader. And she would put her check into the church box. And I thought it was always so sweet. But I would go to cash it and it bounced. Okay, like, so I, I talked to her daughter. I said, hey, you know, what, is everything okay? Like, I've tried cashing it two or three times and it bounced. And oh, my mom, she doesn't have money to give. Like, keep telling her. And I'm like, well, I was going to go to her mom and say, don't give anymore. But I said, you know what? That's a reflection of her heart. I'm not going to stomp on that. So I just said nothing. She kept putting checks in. And what I would do is, I'd go pull the check out. I'd take it out, tear it up, and put it in the trash. Now, she knew no different. But her heart, she just wanted to give. Now, I understood that she couldn't, so I wasn't going to try to take something that she didn't have. And I would tell you this, if you're a widow and you can't pay rent, and it's between giving the church money and paying your rent, pay your rent. As a matter of fact, come to us, and if we can help you, we'll do our best. Because that's what the church is supposed to do. However, if the church has no funds, the church can't do anything. But that's what the church is supposed to do. We're to help. I've told you guys a million times over, and I'm, I'm, I'm out on time, so i got to close out. But look, I do want to do things with this fellowship. I want to build a school. And I want to make it free. And I know that sounds preposterous because you know how much it typically costs to go to school? Like 10 grand a child. Yeah. 5 grand for a lesser school, 7 grand for a middle size. You got to go to a good school, 10 grand. That's what it costs per kid. You got two kids, or we'll make it like 8 grand a kid. And if you go to church, we'll give you a little discount. We're still looking at fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for a year for a kid or two. I want to send them to school for free. I want to, I want, if God lets us, I want to build a school and be like, especially if they come to this church, your kids go free. First pick. And if other churches, and you can prove you go to church and you have a relationship with God, and then we'll talk. It'll either be free or stupid cheap, ridiculous, like cheap, cheaper than like a McDonald's Happy Meal a day cheap. Cheap. Why would I want to do that? Well, because I believe in investing in our kids and I, I think money's crap and... I'd rather invest it in the kids than stick it in our bank account and say, hey, we got a big, big account. And I believe God is big enough to bring it in. Now I'm going to tell you why churches won't do this. Because there's no profit in taking kids to school for free. However, they're misguided. There is a profit. We get to invest in their kids for 40 plus hours a week. Because they'll go to school five days a week. And then they're going to come to church because that's going to be a requirement. Whether it's here or another church, I hope it's here, but if they go somewhere else, that's fine. Just make sure you bring your notes, and I want to sign from your pastor. I want to sign from the pastor that you were in service. And if he doesn't sign it, then you're going to get kicked out of school. I'm going to be a little nicer than that. But you get the point. The investment is there. It's just not the investment that a lot of the churches want. It's not the money investment. Screw the money. Invest in the kids. But it can't be done if the people don't gather. It's one of the reasons I hope our church grows. Because with growth comes more finances. More finances come in, we can get a spot for the kids. We can get a building to teach the kids. We can start raising people up, teachers, finding people in the body that know how to teach, and pay them to teach and do these things. Jacob understands. He gave now. He's got other things to say, but I'm going to stop there. But the tithe is a, a very biblical concept. For the Christian church, giving is a more biblical concept. Paul, quoting Jesus, says, It's better to give than to receive. Now again, don't give beyond your means, please. And if you give, give with a joyful heart. If it bothers you to give, if you feel like you're giving too much, cut back. If you feel like you're not giving enough, add more. If you just can't give and you want to give, that's okay. Again, I believe God is more concerned with your heart than anything. So again, if it's between buying groceries or paying your bills and giving, please pay your bills. And if you're really hurting that bad, come to the church and maybe we can help you. Because that should be our job. But that being said, I am way off course. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being God and for your goodness, mercy, and grace. Thank you for this beautiful body of people. I pray that you would bless them, that you would grow them in knowledge and wisdom and understanding, and most of all, in love, Lord, that they would walk with you and in you. And I pray, Father, that you would do an incredible work in each of our hearts, that you would uphold us with your righteous right hand, that you would lead us and direct us in all your ways, Lord, that you would cause your face to shine on us. I pray, Father, that your will would be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Quickly, I do want to mention something while I'm live. I mentioned Rick Warren on Sunday. 
And I mentioned how people are calling him a, a false teacher and how I think that's wrong. I'm, I'm going to retract that to a degree. So this is why. Turns out that when Rick, Rick Warren left Saddleback, he, he uh, ordained like three female pastors. Now, ladies, we love you. But God has given a biblical outline and mandate, and women aren't called to be pastors. But I want to be a pastor. Well, some dudes want to be women, but that ain't happening. <laughs> yeah. But I got a surgery. Yeah, but your DNA still says you're a male. So I'm so there are there are roles in humanity, and there are roles in the church. Now, women can teach, okay? But they're not to teach as the head pastor over the church. Women ought to teach women in women groups. So like on our Saturday mornings, I'm inviting, if women want to join those teaching things and learn how to study and teach the Bible, join. Come. It's not just for men anymore. Whoever wants to, just realize women, you're not going to get the opportunity to teach in front of the church like the men will. However, I will hope and pray that you ladies and we can put together some women's sessions throughout maybe a month or every couple months where you can use and exercise that gift because there are women who have gifts to teach. However, Rick Warren ordaining pastoral women, that's a direct defiance of scripture. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say shame on him for that. I did not know that till today, and so I'm going to retract shame on him for that. And Rick Warren, if you ever see this, I'm sorry, but shame on you, bro. Like, you repent. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm not going to say you're not a believer. I believe he's a believer. I believe he believes in the Lord. I just, he's in a place where he's wrong. And uh, what you do when you're wrong as a believer is you repent and get right. He should not have done that. So I just wanted to make that clear because I mentioned him on Sunday. So, all right. Love you guys. Bye. <laughs>